Good morning, and welcome to another Angry Bulletin. It appears that an extremely grim moment is approaching in the history of spaceflight. The Boeing Corporation, with its long history of amazing accomplishments in space, including the Saturn V and the Space Shuttle, well, they're looking at getting out of the space industry completely, selling everything to a competitor and focusing on commercial commercial aviation. After all these decades of amazing accomplishments, the history of Boeing in space is drawing to a close. But there's just one problem with that. That's not really what Boeing's trying to do. Instead, what they're trying to do is cut loose the worst part of Boeing space, Boeing Starliner, and everything associated with it that is currently losing Boeing money. But SLS, that cash cow with that cost plus contract that's raking Boeing in billions of dollars every single year, oh, they're keeping that. They're just looking to get rid of everything else. And if Jeff Bezos has any business sense at all, and indeed, if anybody else who's looking at this deal has any business sense, they want to stay very far away from this. And frankly, selling Starliner and selling a big chunk of their space interest is the last thing Boeing wants to do as well. Good afternoon and welcome to another Angry Bulletin here on The Angry Astronaut. I am freehand shooting this segment uh, with my gimbal. Hope the shakiness doesn't bother you. Just trying to get more and more experience in using this thing because I'm going to be using it a lot, especially with upcoming launches. But let's get on to the topic at hand. So let's say that you were in the interest of uh, buying a football team. Let's say that you wanted to buy... The Las Vegas Raiders. But let's also say that in the process of the transaction, you didn't get Max Crosby. Now, for those of you who know anything about the NFL, you know that that's a deal that you would stay far away from. And yet, that is exactly the type of deal that Boeing is potentially offering to buyers right now. And here's why they, especially people like Jeff Bezos, need to stay far away from anything like this kind of deal. So number one bad thing about this deal is obviously the contract that Boeing has with NASA regarding Starliner and what they need to do with this spacecraft in the near future. Starliner received a $4.2 billion budget from NASA for its construction and also for a series of six flights to the International Space Station. As of October of 2024, Boeing's effort to build and deploy employee Starliner has already exceeded this budget by at least $1.85 billion. Now, assuming whoever buys Starliner doesn't inherit this debt, that would make the deal not just bad, but insanely bad, then the question remains, where is the new owner going to realize some sort of profit on this deal? The International Space Station is already suffering from significant structural problems, mostly on the Russian side admittedly, but very serious problems and will almost definitely not make it past 2030, which means the new owners of Starliner really can't expect to fly Starliner any more than the half dozen times that was originally contracted. Had Starliner actually entered service around 2020 or 2021, then NASA would have had to have purchased additional flights from this spacecraft. But that is not the case currently. So how exactly are the new owners of the Boeing Space Division supposed to make any money? Now, they might pick up some other aspects of Boeing's space program, perhaps on the 
the satellite side or some other areas where profits could be realized. But the major millstone around any new owner's neck is going to be Starliner. And it gets even worse when you consider the second problem to this purchase, and that is Starliner itself. This spacecraft is significantly flawed. It's experienced flaws that nobody seems to be able to fix, and ever since 2022, its thrusters have been malfunctioning in almost precisely the same way that they malfunctioned in 2024, over two years of repair efforts without any significant impact. As a matter of fact, it could be argued that the thrusters on Starliner performed even worse during the human rated voyage to the ISS than they did during the orbital flight test number two. That being the case then, what plans would a new owner have to make Starliner into a reliable and profitable spacecraft? I don't see how it could be done. Now, of course, you could say that new owners could bring a new talent, new engineers, a new direction for this spacecraft and eventually fix it. But here's the problem. Nothing that Boeing did really had a negative impact on the first human rated flight that we just saw. Let me say that again. Nothing Boeing did actually had a significant impact on the flight. It was instead Aerojet Rocketdyne because everything that Boeing did to fix this spacecraft from the electrical system, which was supposedly vulnerable to fires, to the software, every other problem that Starliner had was pretty much rectified by the time of the 2024 flight. It was only the thrusters, which were manufactured by Aerojet Rocketdyne and were not fixed by Aerojet Rocketdyne that led to the demise of this test. And to make matters even worse, if you buy Boeing Space Division and Starliner, you're not buying anything from Aerojet Rocketdyne, which means you're doing business with precisely the same subcontractors that screwed up the deal in the first place. In fact, Starliner was built under a philosophy that runs completely contrary to how companies like Blue Origin do business anyway. Starliner was built in the linear traditional fashion of doing business with multiple contractors, have those contractors collaborate in order to create a working product in the end process that takes quite some time, it's also very expensive, and it's completely contrary to Blue Origin and SpaceX's philosophy of keeping as much in-house as you possibly can. How do you integrate a spacecraft like Starliner into Blue Origin's philosophy? In my opinion, you just can't do that. Now, of course, it could be argued that you just replace the Aerojet Rocketdyne RCS thrusters with Blue Origin thrusters. Let's go ahead and swap those out and put in a better quality product, one that Blue Origin can control directly. But the design changes that have to be implemented in order to make something like that work are formidable indeed and something that isn't going to happen overnight. And keep in mind, right now, Starliner has at most maybe six flights ahead of it that have already been paid for with no profits on the horizon. There are no private space flight companies, or at least I don't foresee that there's going to be any companies that are going to purchase flights on Starliner. It's just too expensive. Crew Dragon can do the same thing for less. And also, I anticipate that the Sierra Space Dream Chaser is going to be able to outcompete Starliner for future contracts after 2030 anyway, hands down, because Dream Chaser will not only have the capability of carrying astronauts up to low Earth orbit with the Shooting Star cargo module attached, it will be able to carry cargo and passengers in the same mission, and not only that, it can carry out secondary missions with the Shooting Star after the primary mission is completed because Shooting Star is an independent spacecraft. They can use it simply to dispose of trash on the ISS, something that Cygnus currently does, but now Dream Chaser could do all of that in a single mission, or it could carry out secondary missions, say for the 
U.S. Space Force, as they are currently being contracted to do anyway right now after a primary mission is completed, meaning that Dream Chaser will almost certainly be more competitive price-wise than Starliner will ever be by the time the ISS is deorbited in 2030. So really, what would a prospective buyer for Starliner be purchasing besides a dead-end spacecraft that doesn't work properly? I really don't see an advantage at all. And the final nail in the coffin, the final reason that nobody should be seriously considering this deal is the fact that SLS is not included. Yes, I've been highly critical of SLS. Yes, I believe that SLS is utilizing an outdated philosophy, outdated technology, and will eventually be replaced by Starship. But I also don't feel that that's going to be happening anytime soon. There are quite a number of things with Starship that are going to have to be rectified before NASA is going to allow Starship to be the one-stop shop for transportation to the moon. One of the big things is the lack of an abort system, also the heat shield for re-entry. Given the problems that Orion's already having with their heat shield, I don't see how Starship's heat shield is going to be satisfied factory for NASA with human crew on board for quite some time. So the long and the short of it is SLS is probably going to be around into the early 2030s at least, making Boeing billions of dollars of profits in the process. And regardless of what problems SLS might have and regardless of how expensive it might be, it also clearly works. And we don't have another moon rocket that can carry humans out to the moon, at least not for a while, that actually works, except for this one. And this is what we're stuck with, which means that if the Boeing space purchase actually involved this rocket as well, giving Blue Origin an opportunity to perhaps introduce reusability for the engine, say to replace the RS-25s with BE-4 engines that could perhaps return to Earth with something similar to the smart reusability system that ULA has, anything to try to improve the price point and reusability of this rocket, well, that might make the purchase worthwhile, but it doesn't. Boeing knows what they're doing, and they're only selling off the parts of their space division that aren't making them any damn money. And anyone who's looking at a purchase like this should realize what Boeing is up to here. And by the way, this is the final reason that I think this shouldn't happen. Boeing shouldn't cut loose their less profitable aspects of their space division simply because it happens to be expedient right now. The U.S. government and the U.S. taxpayers entrusted Boeing with, at the very least, the objective of providing us with a backup to Crew Dragon, a secondary solution in case there was a problem with our primary method of getting human beings up to orbit. If Boeing chickens out on this, if Boeing betrays that responsibility and hands it off to somebody else. And if that other company ends up repairing the problem, if they end up fixing something that Boeing is essentially admitting that they can't fix, then that's it for Boeing in space for a very long time, perhaps forever. They'll be able to hold on to SLS because NASA has a contractual obligation to them, but after that, it will be over for Boeing in space flight. And that is something that this company simply should not admit defeat on, especially their new CEO. This guy should really try to demonstrate that he can fix the problems at this company. And the space flight side of things is actually one of the simpler problems to rectify because commercial aviation has lots of requirements and lots of FAA regulations to deal with. Not nearly so bad as what you have to deal with in space flight. Starliner, at least at this point in my opinion, can probably be fixed. It won't be profitable, but it can at least do the bare bones requirement of being a backup spacecraft, which we desperately need. And given the fact that NASA hasn't invested the amount of money necessary to bring a human rated dream chaser into service in anything resembling an acceptable time frame, again, 
This is the only thing we have right now. This is the only backup that NASA has in case something goes wrong with Crew Dragon and Boeing remains, as possible as this might sound, Boeing remains the best company to fix it and they should. And this is especially true given some breaking news that only just now came to my attention regarding Crew Dragon. At an October 31st meeting of the Aerospace Safety Advisory Panel, or ASAP, Kent Rominger, a former astronaut who serves on the committee, went through a list of recent issues with SpaceX's Falcon 9 rocket and Dragon spacecraft and said served as a reminder for the company to remain vigilant as it increased its pace of missions. The issues it mentioned were the July Falcon 9 launch failure when the second stage failed to perform a second burn, which grounded the rocket for a couple of weeks, another upper stage engine anomaly on the launch of the Crew 9 mission on September 29th during a deorbit burn, also grounded the vehicle and then finally there was a landing problem in august as you probably remember when the falcon 9 booster was lost attempting a drone ship landing quote when you look at these recent incidents over the last handful of weeks it does lead one to say that it's apparent that operating safely requires significant attention to detail as hardware ages and the pace of operations increases both nasa and spacex need to maintain focus on safe Crew Dragon operations and not take any normal operations for granted, unquote. And this is especially true given the fact that we don't have a backup spacecraft because of Boeing, and this is a problem that Boeing needs to rectify. Thank you very much for watching. Please don't forget to like and subscribe. Also, please consider supporting this channel on Patreon. I just released another exclusive live stream this time, first time I've ever done this, about why why I believe that there is life in every planetary system in the solar system, all the way from Pluto to Mercury, and I give my reasons for every planet. If you're interested in this, all the details are in the description, and you can become a Patreon supporter for as little as $3 a month. Thanks again, and as always, stay angry about space. <laughs>